So if, if I could uh, invite all the speakers uh, from this first session uh, to come up, and we'll have uh, hopefully lots of questions uh, from, from the floor. So, yes, please, sir. Oh, can I just say, can we hand the microphones out? Uh, just below there. Excuse because we're recording this, and if you don't speak into the microphone, we won't, we won't capture what you're, what you're saying. Hmm? Oh, you see that? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Vijay, I represent the uh, Dorset Wheelchair Vascular Network. Um, I think this is probably for Professor Deeks, really. Um, I ask, it's not to be critical, it's really from a position of ignorance about statistical methods and research methodology, but what do you think is the effect on the in final interpretation of the trial of these spikes in recruitment that occur because of perhaps a meeting like this or a particular push at a vascular society meeting. Um, and it, it, my point is, I suppose, what I'm saying is, is the kind of patient that you're recruiting not going to be consistent throughout the trial because of these pushes? And also, we've illustrated today that you can make one decision on one day and perhaps another decision on another day on the same angiogram. Uh, now, is that random, uh, random effect going to be okay in the trial, or is it not okay? And if I may, it's just one more point. Some people might think a good vein is good because they've got experience of using good vein and getting a good result. Other people might be people who use any, any sort of vein. Um, I hope that I haven't made too many points there. Um, yeah, so I mean, we, we work in a world of what we call pragmatic trials, where we are trying to, to get a sample in the trial of, of what happens in, in NHS plus Sweden practice. Of, uh, and so the patients you recruit form that sample. And if you change who you put into the trial, um, we, would, we might see some differences if the treatment effect depends on that. So what we're coming out with at the end of the trial is an average and that average reflects who the participants were that you recruited. So we do commonly see in clinical trials, it's not an analysis we typically do, but the spectrum of participants who go into the trial, the types of participants change over time. That clinicians get bolder at recruiting patients generally within a, within a, a, a trial, that they realize actually it's more and more important. So for us, what's really important is that you put in the patients into this trial who uh, I would do so as, as uh, and the word we had from colleagues in Sweden is the, the why not put this patient in the trial. So to actually get it as broad so that the patients you're putting in are the ones for which the question gets answered. So it, it is, is what you're saying that all those confounders, if you like, are compensated for in the, in the methodology? They're not confounders because we randomize, uh, because they have equal chance of getting either treatment. Um, so if we did a larger trial and we'll um, we have plans to do a meta-analysis together with the US trial at the end of this. It may enable us to actually look at subgroups within the trial who have different anatomical um, aspects or other characteristics. As it is designed at the moment, we don't have the statistical power to look at small groups within the trial to say patients like this are more likely to benefit from one than the other. Uh, so it's not confounding. All it is is saying that the results are in terms of we'll come out at the end saying treatment A is better than treatment B or the same as treatment B or the other way around, that is the average for the whole cohort you have recruited um, from that. So it may be there are still some subtleties. You know, we would want to move into this world of personalized medicine where we can actually characterize patients so well that we know this one will do well on that treatment. Now that's optimism in the extreme, as far as I can see, because what we can tell from this is the average. Did that cover all of the questions? Uh, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Lady Dowd. Um, uh, Rosie Darwood from Leeds. Um, just, I don't want to sound negative, because it's obviously a really important trial, but do you worry, given the pace of recruitment, despite how common critical limb ischemia and intrapropital disease is, um, that there may be criticisms at the end of the trial regarding the generalizability. Um, and I suppose the other thing related to that is the endovascular treatment may develop throughout the trial, whereas the surgical treatment is going to remain 
presumably fairly similar, um, and will that affect how the results are interpreted? Who still wants to take that one? Um, John? No, I, uh, I, 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 this is not uncommon the speed of recruitment. So yes, it's not as good as us recruiting every patient who could have been recruited, um, but it's the best we're doing. So yes, there will be criticism, but is that, will it still be the best answer to this question? Will it be better than what we know now? I think it would be. So um, yes, I mean, you're the people in the room who can recruit to this trial, and the best thing would be is if you went back tomorrow and recruited a patient each uh, tomorrow, and then again on Friday, um, and then next Monday and next Tuesday and so on like that. If you all did that, we'd get to the end very quickly and we'll be able to actually deflect those criticisms. So the more representative our sample, the better. In terms of changes in treatment, in terms of the endovascular changes, well, I'm not the person to comment on that, but I don't think it's come out as a major concern. Is that no, true? I mean, Lewis, Matt, do you want to take that yeah, on? I think, I think the evidence I've shown earlier showed there's a lot of improvements in anatomical endpoints, but I don't think there's a, any hard evidence in terms of randomised trial that's shown improved uh, or improved benefits in clinical or cost effectiveness for any endovascular treatment over a vein bypass. Just to, uh, to comment on that, first, uh, I just looked up at on our uh, results on vein bypass, and our results are significantly better for the last uh, five years than they were 10 years ago. So perhaps something is improving even in that area also. Uh, I have a question to um, Dr. Malmstedt. Congratulations on your very fine track record and the great work you're doing for this you. very important uh, study. Um, I've been struggling lately uh, with in, uh, including patients, and one of the, the problems I have is that I find it difficult to consent the patients. If I tell them we don't know which is better, they say, well, then I'll go for the balloon, and then I say, well, last time we checked, it was better with the bypass, then they say, well, then give me the bypass, <laughs> and I say, well, <laughs> we don't really know, they've got new balloons now, well, then I want the new balloon, but they definitely don't want to be randomized. And how do, how, do, how do you tell the patients, how do you ask them, do you have any good ideas what we can do? Uh, first, uh, thanks again, for, for you was the one who inspired us to, to join the trial, so, and we also inspired by the coding. You worked with this for a long time, so thanks. I think one important thing is to tell the patient that this is not actually a choice between two treatments. It's a choice between two treatment strategies. Which should we do first? That's because you, if a failed PTA could be a bypass, and a failed bypass could be a PTA. And then I try to really say that you could, as a patient, you could be in one of three states. Either we see that we, we are certain that bypass is the best for you, then you will not join the trial. Or we would see that endo is the best, and then you will not join the trial either. But then we have this gray zone where we is guessing, we is really doing a qualified guess. And instead of we guessing what's it's best for you, if you go in the trial, the, the chance will decide what we, what we start with. And I think most patients is very fine with it. Um, my problem is, is if you have a short time before intervention, then you, you don't have enough time to have the talk with the patient and they feel stressed and then, oh, no, I, I will not. So, um, was this the answer? <laughs> I don't yeah, think. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, Nick, and then I think Cliff the next. Yeah. Nick Charles from Manchester. Um, this arose uh, a practical question arising from Jonas' talk. In Basel three, we've been happy to randomise patients on the table, but in Basel two, we haven't felt able to randomise patients on the table. And I think the reason for that comes down to, I can't remember the protocol word for word, but I think it says something like eligibility for Basel II has to be confirmed by a properly constituted, minuted MDT comprising surgeon and radiologist. Have I got that wrong? 
we've, we've softened it a bit, but you're right, that's, that was the original wording. Um, yeah, uh, we have softened it a bit. And we've softened it to having two consultants being in agreement. That could be two surgeons, a surgeon, a radiologist, or two radiologists. Because we realized that that was an unrealistic goal that we would have what you've just described. Yeah. Yeah, and I, my colleagues will tell me how many patients have been randomized on table. Um, it's, it's fewer than in Basel III, but I don't actually know the percentage, but we could find that out for you. Yeah. <coughs> uh, Cliff. Um, Thanks, Cliff Sherman. It, it's really a question about the randomization process and the MDT. I mean, I come from Munich, Southampton, where I'm afraid we failed miserably in terms of recruitment because of our inability to come to a uh, position of equipoise. I make no excuses for that. We've heard a lot of the reasons. But I'll make some observations and then a question. If you look at any interventional performance of a clinician during their career, it goes in waves, and that's been particularly done in cardiac surgery. If you have a good run, you take on more and more complicated stuff until you have bad runs, and then you back off again. And I think all people involved with Basel will be doing that all the time. So there's a, an individual variation depending on your confidence in previous short-term experience. That's been particularly focused in the UK, and it must be the same in Sweden, with surgeon-specific outcome data reporting. And so there's a lot of other things going on in MDT, and a lot of it is avoidance of poor outcome. So when you show us the angiograms, some of those angiograms, you'd be happy if they landed up in your plate, whatever the treatment was, because they looked like they're going to do well. Others, you had a bad feeling about because of poor runoff and so on. There's a lot of avoidance. And I, I just wonder if you noticed any changes, particularly in the UK, with certain specific data outcome reporting, because it's had a big effect on, on behavior and case selection in, in other areas. Anybody? I, th I think it doesn't help that the data acquisition, particularly for angioplasty, is very poor in the MVR. So <coughs> there's more of a, um, I guess, a preponderance for people to put people down an endo route because they're not actually reported outcomes yet. Um, so I think it would help if the acquisition and the reporting was st equally strong for both interventions, and then it may make people have more equipoise. Um, yeah. uh, I'm Adib Bandel from Colchester. Uh, the question is for Lewis Meacham. You showed all DSA angiograms being used for decision making, but what we use is CT angiograms or maybe some places MR angiograms which are definitely more inferior in quality to the C to the DSA angiograms. So is, and if we are doing a DSA angiogram, then obviously we've already gone down the path of endovascular because that's when the DSA is being done. So for this trial, do we need to have DSAs for all the patients? It's not obligatory, but my sense is that people are increasingly moving back to conventional angiography to delineate infrapopetial disease. Pass one of my colleagues at Heft. Do you, do you want to say anything about that, or yeah, well, do you want to take the microphone? Because um, I know Aral has uh, Aral is our s in a, uh, one of our main trial interventional radiologists. Hoss is one of my vascular surgical colleagues, but does a lot of endo. Um, yeah, I think you know if we're deciding on a on a tibial bypass. Uh, we always go for a DSA to delineate, particularly looking at the arch and seeing whether there, there's a good arch or not. And to be honest with you, when there's a lack of an arch, I would be more reluctant to do surgical bypass because with endo, you can go into the arch and open that endovascularly. But yes, for in heft, all our tibial bypasses have a DSA before, before operation. I mean, I visited a, a center nowhere near here, but I won't say where it was, and I sat through their MDT, <laughs> and they use MRA, and I very politely pointed out, and they were saying, well, these, none of these patients are suitable, when actually you couldn't see any vessels below about the mid-calf. And when I pointed it out, I got asked, to, I got shown the door, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't like that. You know. But I, I could not have, I mean, if you're going to do endo anyway, well, you maybe don't need that good at imaging, you could argue, but if you're going to do a bypass and you're going to randomize patients, you, you ha and I say, well, where are the foot views? And they kind of looked at me, like, you know, you know dinosaur. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think it's a really good point. And, and you, you're you using DSA exclusively, yeah. really, for these cases? Uh, a lot of the, uh, I think half of the patients ha has a DSA, uh, and all 
all patients with a bypass have a DSA. And, and we have the same struggle with the MRA. It's good to down to the decim 10 centimeters below the knee and then can't really. And I also ask the interventional radiologist, would you, can you plan your endo procedure from this, by, from this MRI or CT? And they almost always say, no, let's make a, a DSA. So I think a key point of this trial is getting good imaging, including the foot. Uh, I think that's a recurring theme. Any other questions? Patrick, I just get you get the uh, microphone, then we, we're capturing all this on the uh, on the recording. Hi, Patrick Chong from Frimley Park. Thanks to all the speakers for their excellent talks. Um, we um, have over a hundred patients in our screening log, and I think we perhaps suffer from maybe, um, you know, Professor Sherman in Southampton, quite a conservative, they're, they're a very great, talented bunch of radiologists, quite, quite conservative uh, interventional radiology department. So, uh, you know, a lot of what we've seen on the uh, display just now would have gone to bypass, and most of my vascular colleagues would be prepared to operate on those patients. I just wondered whether other people felt the same, that, you know, uh, it's more of a problem with our IR departments and quite sensible interventional radiology departments, I think. Well, it's interesting. I mean, we've, I've visited pretty much every centre, uh, several of them more than one time, in fact. And I've sat through dozens of M MDTs, and I get, I mean, this is an oversimplification, but I, I get the sense that some units are very pro-surgery and some units are very pro-endo. And I remember going to see two hospitals in the south of England that were less than 15 miles apart, really. Um, they weren't a single unit. And they had a completely different mindset. So one said, well, our interventional radiologists are really good below the knee. We don't really need to do bypasses here, so we can't really be involved in the trial. Hospital B, 15 miles along the road, said, well, our radiologists don't really like going below the knee. They're not very confident. And our guys really like doing distal bypass. So we basically just do distal bypass until we can't put any patients in the trial. And we say, have you spoke to the guys you know, at the end of the street there? Because that's not the way they think. And they go, well, you know, it's just the way we do it. And we're happy with what we do. So within individual MDTs, you often get a group think, very little open-mindedness, not wanting to be They're happy. They've got used to working in that way. But 10, 15 miles or, or less down the road, it's completely different. And this is the point I think Lewis was making. There's individual equipoise, there's individual MDT equipoise, and then there's the professional, you know, 67 consultants. I've shown the data, you know. So how do we break out of that groupthink within our little silos that we work in? And, you know, hopefully doing this kind of exercise just allows people to think a bit more carefully about that. Lewis, any comments on that? Well, so I echo that. We visit lots and lots of centres, and you will find some that are very close that have completely different attitudes towards it. Some will be all endo, some will be all bypass. There's very few that are very balanced and will just take it as it comes. Most, most units have developed their own bias, and they're comfortable with it, even though their bias is completely different to the neighbouring hospital. Um, and I understand where that comes from. I think the other thing with the surgical outcomes, everyone gets focused on the 30-day outcomes because that's what's reported in the NVR, but the outcomes for these patients are long-term, and as units, we need to be analysing what are happening to them six months, a year down the line, maybe two or three years, to really understand <laughs> whether what you're doing is better than the other treatment, because we all feel that if we get them out of hospital and back home, job done, forget about it, but actually, most of these people's complications are after 30 days. And that's, where, that's the kind of results we aren't capturing as a specialty because the MVR doesn't go that far. This quality of revascularization, it should be more than just a body and leg count. And we're very keen to capture quality of revascularization through wound healing, relief of pain, quality of life. That's really important. Um, this focus on what happens in the first 30 days, which has been driven by certain developments in the way that our profession is scrutinized, can be pretty unhelpful uh, and distort practice in a way that in the medium and long term actually does not serve the patients well. And I think we, we can all think of examples of that. Um, yes, please, sir. James. James? Yeah, James Dawson. Um, to, to Jonas or to Andrew. Can you take me through 
the patient pathway of a on-table conversion on angiography, so a randomization at the time of DSA. I, I'm unclear as to how that consent change is dealt with ethically. You've got a patient with a needle in their groin ready to go forward because you've obviously consented them for the angiogram in the first place because they're not randomized at this stage. So could you just talk to me about the practicalities of how you convert someone into basal at that stage, possibly a surgical change? Well, Gonas, do you want to speak to that? How, how do yeah. you do on table? Because I think half of your patients are on table, yeah. so, you know. Basically, uh, the process is, is started long before the patient is, is on the table. Um, and the reason why is or she's on the table is that the, the MRI or the CT is not sufficient to, to determine the treatment, or they have uh, a renal insufficient, uh, you, you will not give them the, the contrast, it's better to do that. And then I, uh, we talk about this, this, this is a two-part procedure. First, we get the map of your vessels. And when we get the map of your vessels, we will look at the, uh, at the images and discuss which of these three groups you will fit in. If we agree that endo is the best treatment for you, we will just proceed with the endo. If we agree that endo is not a good option, you should have a, a bypass, then we will end, it will only be diagnostic and we will uh, uh, schedule you for the next uh, free uh, OR time. But if we are on equipoise, so we, we can't really say which is the best, then we will log into the system and let uh, the, the, the chance uh, decide. And most patients are, are happy with this, but we, I tell them very clearly long before how the process will be in detail. So they, they know, uh, and we are there. there the, I'm almost always there together with a with radiologist. So I can talk to the patient during the angio, um, or my colleagues is on place there. So I think then the patients, they will also feel comfortable because their consultant is there overlooking everything and have a discussion. Um, so it's developing a, a, with you a, a, a mutually trusting relationship with yeah. the patient from the very moment that you first see the patient. Really. Yes. That's, I think that early identification is, is really important. Well, I, I should probably speak to the inter my interventional radiology uh, colleagues, you know, logistically, how do you plan your work, Hoss? I mean, do you want to take that? I mean, you, you do a bypass and endo, so I mean, how, how do you do it logistically? Yes, in heft, if the patient hasn't been recruited and you do the angio and you're faced with a complex tibial disease and you don't know what to do, I usually stop and say to the patient, your disease is quite complicated, the outcomes of intervention are unknown. I would like to discuss this with my colleagues and see what's the best thing for you. And I stop. And then I take the patient or the case back to the MDT and we discuss in the MDT and then we decide whether this is a suitable for Basel 3 or Basel 2 or not. And then we recruit the patient. But yes, we stop. Okay. One last question, because we are we, we do have some delicious lunch for you. Uh, there's a lady down here. Yes. Probably make this the last question so you do get fed and watered. Uh. Um, hi, I'm Kimberly from um, United Lincolnshire Hospital, Pilgrim. My question with the over recruiting are the patients then who are not randomised in a different section? Because obviously you've consented them. Is that seen as an intention to treat or not because you haven't randomised them? I would say no, but I'll. I'll let Professor Deeks. Um. We, we uh, intention to treat is from the point of randomization. So consent, but not actually getting to the point of getting a randomized allocation, um, they're, they're not counted in, in the analysis. 
mean, there are many trials that over consent was the term that Jonas, you, you, you consent them, but you don't randomize them. And that, in my experience, is pretty common in surgical trials. And, and there's no ethical barrier to that. It's not inappropriate. I mean, would you agree, John? I mean, it's been your experience. So. Okay, well, thank you very much for your, we've captured all this on video and recording, so it'll all be available.